so we're glad to have Tom here, um, and Tom and Davis Jenkins have been both been good partners. I'd like to say to them, you know, that we that they really are the pioneers, that that they're the ones clearing the brush, pointing the way, uh, and the rest of us are, are trying to follow, and, and maybe with megaphones, but we're following their lead. And so today, for a few minutes, <clears throat> you might think about this as the as the, as the community college research center's greatest hits. Uh, we've taken some excerpts from their um, research. Uh, that we think really does point the way uh, to strategies um, that we need to be focused on and strategies uh, that can lead us to more successful interventions. And so the, the first of all, and, and a lot of the work they've done uh, has been around uh, developmental education. And so we've selected this expert excerpt um, as a way to start this conversation with Tom. And they've done a lot of studies, um, many of them finding, uh, come to the same conclusions uh, about how well remediation does or does not work. And so, Tom, I'd like you just to kind of expand, expand a little bit on your thinking and your work uh, around DevEd. I don't know if that's the first work you did, but clearly that, that's been a substantial amount of your work. Okay, so, so before I answer that, I just want to say that I, um, the, the work we've done has really been a group effort. Uh, Davis is here, has been crucial due to Scott Clayton. You'll see that her uh, work is featured in this uh, as well, Shauna Jaggers. Clive Belfield, so um, it's really a, a, a wonderful group, and, and we couldn't have done it without the cooperation of, of people like yourselves. Also, I think our, our job is really easy uh, in the sense of kind of trying to understand what's going on. You really have the difficult uh, task of, um, of trying to do it. There's, no, there's certainly nothing that's more satisfying to a researcher than to see their, their work used, so um, uh, it's a great partnership with uh, Complete College America. So we, we uh, started several years ago trying to say, does remediation work? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer for various reasons. But the, the sort of way we approached it was, if you think about um, a student who has maybe a 50% or 40 or 50% chance of being successful in a college uh, level course, a first college level course, and let's say we can tell that from the assessments, uh, what do we do? Is that good enough? So we think it probably isn't good enough, so let's give them some services. Let's put them in a class that will um, prepare them. That's the words that we use that will presumably then make them successful. So go from 50% to 100%. Well, that doesn't, that's not going to happen, but what would we, be, what would we consider successful? 50% to 60%? So the work that we did actually found that it wasn't changing that at all. Uh, that students who are in remediation, if, if we think they started out with a 50% chance of, com of being successful in a college level course, when they were done with that, or at least these are for students who were assigned to remediation, uh, often uh, they, those students were successful at that same rate in the college level course. So we, we did this several years ago. Uh, it's now been done in several states. Uh, we've done it with community colleges in New York, Florida, uh, Texas, other people have done it in Tennessee, California. So I think the general conclusion that at least, especially for students who are sort of at the upper end of the developmental range, that um, you know, we've come to the conclusion that developmental, that as it was done, as it has been done historically, has not been very effective. In, uh, in Tom, I guess too, and I, I said it, but, but I guess you also found that significant numbers of students start in remediation that's why you wanted to turn some of your time and attention to it. Yes, certainly there are 60, I mean, some colleges have 90% uh, students who start out in remediation. Um, if you take, uh, say, uh, students assigned to at least three levels below college level in math, in our data set from, from Achieving the Dream, uh, we found that 20%, uh, so a fifth of all college students start out, at least have in the past, start out with at least three semesters, presumably, of math that they need to do before they're judged to be ready to take a college level course. Okay, let's um, move on. And I, I think that this is really one of the more uh, significant, significant findings. And I, I had had the opportunity to read most of the work that the, the CCRC has done, and I find it very well written, but it always kind of surprises me that people have missed this point uh, because I think it's one of the more uh, important points in the, in the research uh, that they've done. This concept, it's not that a student doesn't pass an, a single class, and a lot of dev ed instructors would say, they, these students do pass our classes. 
uh, but it's about attrition. So, so that also has been a, not only a key finding, but a consistent finding in the work you've done. Yeah, so, so we, um, we, we really had, uh, we were fortunate enough to get the, uh, the data from Achieving the Dream. And the, cru the, the unique aspect of that data was that it said whether the student was referred to remediation and at what level. A lot of the research just was whether you took remediation, not whether you referred to it. And so we uh, tracked individual students from their referral to wherever it is that they went. And I think there were two sort of crucial things that, uh, that came out of that. One, of course, was that immediately, you know, you can't talk about remedial courses. You have to have talk about remedial sequences. I mean, it's an entire curriculum, you know, as I said before, s several semesters. And uh, if you think about that, <coughs> Just uh, uh, if, you, if you have, let's say, an 80% completion rate from a particular course, which seems pretty good, if you put three of those together, then from your Algebra 1, you'll know that you give 0.8 times 0.8 times 0.8, and you're getting down uh, below 50%. And that's assuming that everybody actually takes those courses. So the second insight was that we found that more people exited those sequences without having failed or withdrawn from a course, then actually failed or withdrew from courses. Many students are assessed and then don't show up, but they successfully complete level three and then don't show up for level two. So I think that's a crucial question. Part of the issue is simply getting the students into the course. So I think that's a, that, that uh, the distinction between failing a course or withdrawing versus not actually enrolling. Uh, I think is a crucial question, and, and in a way, I, while I was that was somewhat surprising to me, I was somewhat encouraged because I think it, it's it's a one it's an, I think there are lots of ways that we can think about fixing that problem that may not be as difficult as uh, you know other ways that would involve significantly changing how we teach or something like that. Well, what are the other quotes that I always struck me, and and on the face of it, it doesn't make sense, but. Um, but essentially, there was one quote that said that if you and I were both assigned to remediation and that you skipped it and started in the regular course, and I actually took the remedial sequence, that you would actually do better than I. And so, intuitively, it doesn't make sense, but can you explain? Well, there's, certainly, there, there's certainly some, I mean, some states, it's, it's voluntary or people get around it in various ways. And so, those, so, so we certainly find in some cases that students who were assigned to remediation but then get into the regular college-level course do as well as students who, so to speak, take their medicine and proceed through. Now, I, I, I want to say that that doesn't necessarily mean that every, if we got everybody to skip that they would do as well. I think that uh, reflects several things. I mean, first of all, if you go through your sequence, you have all those opportunities to leave and you never actually get into the course. Uh, but also, it may be that those students um, have a better sense of what their skills are than we do. And so they may say, okay, actually, I know that. So I think there's, I think that that fact that many students actually, uh, or so, students who sometimes are able to skip remediation and go into college, of course, seem to do well or as well as, as others, I think there's quite a few different explanations for why that happens. Good. And so this is an illustration, um, I think, of the research um, that, that Tom is talking about. Um, and as you can see, and this is, these are students, these are math students, uh, and Tom uh, alluded to the ones that are start three levels down. Uh, and not only do you end up with very few students that actually complete the gateway course, um, but you're more likely to lose the students through attrition than you are because they failed the course. I just, I, I was speaking at a college once and I had these data and, um, and they showed me their data and, and I noticed that between two levels they hadn't lost anyone and so I said, and this was a few years ago before this was, so I said, well, well how'd you do that? And they said, well, we put those courses together. So there wasn't a gap between them. So I thought that, that's why I said, I thought there's some, there's some easy, easier ways to try to address this, or at least to begin to make progress on it. So this raises another issue, and this is about tests. Most everybody in the country uses placement tests. They use AccuPlacer, they use Compass. Um, there's a placement process. It is pretty test reliant. Um, but but uh, the Community College Resource Center has also done work on the placement process, and this is just one of many findings, um, but I think it represents, uh, Tom? Okay, so I, I think this, uh, the, the research that we did, which was basically essentially looking at the validity of the assessment tests, that is how well did they predict uh, 
uh, success with students. And I think that uh, there, are two, there are two sort of insights that, that I sort of got out of this. First of all, it, it really showed the problem of underplacement. That is, the number of students who are placed in remediation who could be successful in a college level course. And we found that in some of the data sets that we had, as many as 20% of students placed in remediation could get a B in a college level course. So 20% of the people who were, who were assessed could get a B in the college level course. So I think that this was, uh, to, to me, I hadn't really thought about that before. I thought the problem with remediation was that uh, it, it took students with weak skills and it didn't do a good enough job of strengthening those skills. I'd never really thought much about the fact that you got many students who were coming in uh, who, who in fact didn't need it. And so they're wasting their time with that, our money, their money, uh, and, and in some cases because of that they you know, they exit. So the underplacement issue was, was, a, uh, was one insight. And now we also looked at, of course, there is overplacement. So we, we came up with this high, uh, with this, uh, with a severe error rate, uh, which, which combined the students who were placed in remediation who could get a B, and the students who were placed in college level courses who failed. And that was often about 30%. But one interesting thing was that if you take the, the, the where we put the placement, the, the, the cutoff score as a kind of an indication of our values, we're much more concerned about putting students into college level courses who aren't going to succeed than we are about putting them into developmental ed if they don't need it. So think about that for a minute. Why is it that we, uh, that, that we, that, that we're, we're, if we're going to err, we're going to make sure that somebody is not in high, in the college level course and we'll put them in remediation. I think that's a significant uh, issue to think about. The, the, the second really uh, insight was that we think about uh, remediation in two, as a, sort of I think, I think of it as a two bucket strategy. There's the college ready, these are the words with college ready, and developmental. So there's two groups of students, and so we sort of think we're going to get an assessment that's going to identify those two. If you're in developmental, you can be successful in college ready. If you're in college ready, you will be successful. And in fact, and then what do we do with developmental education? We're going to raise the students up to the college level. Of course, that's not really true. Because even with our assessments, there's kind of a gradual function. So we're cutting into that function with a placement, uh, uh, with, a, with a cutoff score that's really arbitrary. So the difference between some students who are in, quote, college ready and others who are developmental might be one or two percentage points on their probability of being successful in the college level course. So we cannot really divide students into two distinct categories and deal with them that way. So I think, I think that really supports the idea that we need to, to blur that distinction. I think the, 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 the co-requisite model and other types of things that recognize that, these, that there's a continuum of students uh, and we need to both you know, deal with that. And uh, the other thing about this is there are lots of students we label as college ready who also struggle. So a focus on remediation in its traditional sense doesn't do very much about those students either. Well, I think too, and I spent, I've spent a lot of time in my career, not necessarily productively, but working on testing, and there's this belief system that we all have that if we test and we get results, they must be true and they must be accurate. Uh, and I know the tests we use in high school cost at least $25 or $30 a test. These tests are $2 tests. Um, and I think that there's something too that, that we're trying to be more precise with our instruments uh, than we can possibly be. Yes, well, well one of the things that we, we, we did was uh, we compared um, placement with um, ActiPlacer and Compass to uh, using uh, students' high school GPA. And um, in fact, we found that, that we could significantly reduce the severe error rate using the GPA only not, um, I think we would probably say you'd use them both, but if you just use that, and when you think about that for a minute, um, you know, uh, uh, these assessments are, are assessments that we give to students for, they're cheap, they take a short amount of time, that's the good thing, we have thousands of students we have to put through this, this process. Uh, they, they test students' skills in two academic areas, mathematics, reading, or writing, uh, and uh, that's it. And of course, we know that a student's success in college is not going to be determined only by those things. Whereas if you think about the GPA, it's not only uh, a reflection of the 
judgment about that student from several adults who worked closely with them, uh, but it also reflects non-cognitive issues as well. So certainly the, the uh, uh, while I do think we can do a better job uh, with assessments and uh, after our research and other things, there's, uh, all of the assessment uh, organizations are trying to improve their assessments and I think that's great, but I do think that that you know, ultimately we need to use broader uh, type of information. And what that means is that colleges have to have access to that information to the, to the, stu to the student's record. And often that's very difficult. It's kind of a bureaucratic or a, you know, a technical issue which we ought to solve. But also to recognize the even, even the best placement process you put together is still an impress Improvised measure, improvised uh, measure. I, 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 I certainly agree with your last statement that you said here, which was that you can't do them alone. Uh, I certainly think that uh, if somebody says, okay, the assessment doesn't work very well, let's come up with a new assessment and placement system, and that's the main thing, is that that, I, 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 certainly, I don't think we'll find that that will be that successful. Good, thank you. So moving on, and you, you talked about co-requisite support, the idea of, I mean, the basic premise here is eliminating the attrition point that you just talked about. And again, this is from some of the work that you've done. Yeah, well, I, I think that, you know, this, this is the points that, I, that I've been making already. Uh, um, one of the, I mean, we've certainly seen, and I know that you'll hear from, from some of these examples uh, 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 in the next two days, the, the, the uh, accelerated learning program at the Community College of Baltimore County, Chabot, Community College of Denver. We've looked at many of these. And, you know, essentially one way or the other, they're trying to get students into college level courses faster. Now, just the, I think what we've found is that uh, if you take students who, are, who would traditionally have been referred to remediation and put them in a college course with some kind of assistance to them, I mean, I don't think we should just put them in the college course as they are now. One of the things that we find is that those, of course, the enrollment in the college level course already goes up automatically because that's what the program is. You put them in the college level course. So now the question is, how well do they do in that college level course? Now, it might be a problem if they can't do very well, and so yes, you get them in there, but they all fail. So we find that the, uh, this is a generalization but the, in, in these types of programs, but the outcomes for those, for those, uh, uh, for the, those students who would have been in, in remediation or about the, the graduation rate, or about the same level as, or the completion rate, about the same level as the students who go through remediation. So you don't lose anything in the graduation rate, and you gain a lot in the enrollment. So now, once again, that's really a question of trying to get them, you know, in enrollment is an important issue. And uh, actually one of the more interesting um, strategies, in addition to the typical putting students into college level courses, but with support, like in math and English, is also this, this concept of contextualized uh, dev ed where you might be taking your reading course in conjunction with your history course, and so you're reading more about history as well as you're doing, I know Miami Dade's doing a lot of that, a lot of colleges are, um, but it has the, the same I think kind there's of good, there, there's definitely connecting, connecting the dev ed to the college level course has, has a lot of, uh, uh, of, of, of research supporting that in terms of contextualization. I do want to say that I, I think that um, that it, one thing's very important is that we should not think about dev ed in isolation. We not, should not think of it as only preparing for that first college level course, but it needs to be the first experience a student has in college. It needs to be attached to their entire, uh, their entire college level program. I mean, we like to think of this as uh, it's, it's an on-ramp to, uh, uh, to the college level program. Now it's a barrier, it's a, it's a hurdle that students have to leap over and often don't. Uh, so I think both in terms of contextualization and just in terms of these structural issues that we've been talking about, you know, by connecting it to the college level program, I think it, it you know, will, 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 will make a big difference. Great. I'm glad you used the word structural because I, I mean, I think that that's what a lot of us have been kind of focused on, these structural changes that don't depend upon a charismatic dev ed instructor or, a, a, in, you know, a president, um, but instead change structurally how we deliver instruction instruction. Um, leading to structure, um, I, we, I guess we walked right into that. So um, this is some of your more recent work um, on structure. I know you've done a lot of work on structure, a lot of work on, on I know Davis especially uh, has been, you know, pushing out the idea of clear pathways, getting students engaged in work, 
but, but talk for a few minutes about structure. So, I, I mean, I think that this, the, the, the notion that uh, students, anybody really, faced with complex, high-stakes decisions that they don't understand, uh, don't, do, they don't do very well. I mean, you know, my $50,000 in retirement savings, somebody comes and says, here are your 500 stocks and bonds. You, you know, figure out what to do with them. You know, my money stays in bank at 0.2% interest. Same thing with a community college student. Uh, you know, if it, we have dozens of courses, I have to 8,000 or any community college will not only have all those courses, but they'll have many, many uh, programs. Um, you know, the elite colleges don't do that. I mean, I went to a selective college. We had 45 majors. There was a lot of assistance to that. Uh, so uh, I, I think it makes a lot of sense that if we're going to put students into uh, a very complex uh, uh, institution, uh, we now, of course, if we had a lot of, 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 of advising and help for them, that might help them out, but we don't have that either. And remember, these are students whose parents didn't go to college and who are probably from high schools you know, where everybody else isn't in college so they can rely on friends and family to get the type of information that will help them navigate uh, this complexity. Want to, again, point out, Davis, where, I can't see you. Where are you? Okay, Davis Jenkins uh, will be here most of the day. Tom Bailey. Uh, we want to thank them. They've been great partners uh, for all the work they've done. And as, as I said, they've really been the, the pioneers in this whole uh, effort to improve uh, college completion. So let's thank both uh, Davis and Tom very much.